You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to be joined by Alexandra and Alexander uh, Onderil, who write under the pseudonym Lars Kepler, and they have a fantastic new book. Uh, it's called Lazarus, and it uh, when you're hearing this, it's available everywhere now. Uh, what book? Welcome back to the show, Alexandra and Alexander. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I've uh, like I was just mentioning a few minutes ago, I've got the new book, uh, Lazarus, and I'll tell you what: each with each book, you guys just ratchet up the tension more and more and you know with your last book i was like that you know this is this has to be the pinnacle of a writing career and and you guys have outdone yourselves again you wait nazareth was it was really a very important book for us to write because it's it's also kind of a climax for the struggle that john alina our main character and saga bauer the other main character has yeah, lived with for so oh, long yeah. time. We, our first book, The Hypnotist, so it's, it's a shadow of the serial killer, Eurog Walter, which have followed them <laughs> through the whole series, and this is a climax. So thank you for your kind words. When, uh, did, you, did you know all along that this you were kind of leading up to this climax, or... Did uh, did the climax come about in the writing of this book, did, if that makes sense? Yeah, well, we knew that it would happen, yeah. but we didn't know exactly which book. So we, so when we finished The Rabbit Hunter, it was just totally clear to us, um, this is it. This is the final battle, in a way, so Lazarus. We, we knew that it would happen someday, but uh, <laughs> no, not uh, we had, hadn't planned which book, so we just waited for the right one here it comes yeah when uh when you're thinking uh do you have like a a, a master plan you, you said that when you're writing your last book you you could see that this would be the climax uh coming up but but do you have a a, a master plan that you're working from that you know that that certain characters need to have you know, a, a, a certain growth, uh, you know, is there a, a, a place that you're writing toward? Not really, actually, because uh, we live like together with our characters uh, and we write also write in the present tense, you know, so everything is happening here and now in our books, even for us. Uh, but, but of course, um, we have some ideas and thoughts, but we try to listen to to the story story itself and the characters themselves. So uh, we are following. <laughs> yeah, and it has to be organically in a way because sure we could plan everything, but I don't think that would be so good. We need to have this intuition as well, this ear for the the characters, so to speak. And I, what Alexander meant when he. She said uh, that we knew that this was it was time for the for the Europe water to return was it's uh, it's when we end a book um, it's the writing process is crazy intensive the last weeks of the process we we just skip everything else you know the laundry the dishes and <laughs> write and write and write <laughs> and when we reach our goal we just breathe out and if we feel totally empty that we like gave it all and this is it we will never ever be able to write another creative sentence again so we start with the dishes and we do the laundry <laughs> and after a few days usually we have a new idea and this time after the rabbit hunter we knew that okay it's happening now 
Yeah. Let's start Not to plan the, for the yeah. next book. The dead man is <laughs> coming back. <laughs> Well, this idea of, uh, of of doing things until the inspiration comes or until a, a plot point is is worked out. Um, do you have uh, is there a system that you guys work where one of you uh, is plotting and the other one is thinking about, you know, how to put uh, skin on the bones as it were, you know, to add depth to character or uh, do you brainstorm together? Are you you know, bouncing plot points off of one another. How, how does that, that collaboration work between the two of you? Well, we, we try to do everything together, actually. We share every little part of the process. Yeah, and it's important because since we are two writers, we need to know that we write the same book. So, uh, so I think that's why we are plotting together, discussing mm-hmm. together, building up the story. And do research together yeah. all the time. And it's, everything is built on an ongoing conversation between us. So we talk about the story and the characters, you know, always. Uh, it's really annoying for our children, of course, because we talk and talk and we you know, start with the dinner and we continue to talk about Jonah and Saga and so forth. But I think it's good for us to have this. A conversation because it's quite complicated stories and it's good to be you know testing the each each idea each uh, turn and twist yeah and also uh, we we do want our all our books to be to be standalones in a way so so that's why we often have new characters um we don't want everything to happen to John Alina and Saga Bauer in book after book, but with Lazarus, it was time for them to be the real protagonists. Yeah, it was part of the idea to 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 let them be the main characters, only main characters in the story. Um, so that, together with the, the return man, was the, <laughs> was a basic idea when we started the plotting. The um with with Lazarus this is the is this the seventh book uh with these characters yeah, yes yeah it's, it's seventh. the seventh book did did uh did that have any meaning any particular meaning to you you know that, that people might think you know well seven is a is a number of completion it's a it's a finished <laughs> week you know um did 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 that play have any factor in that at all Oh, well, I, I've always thought that seven is a magical number in a way. Uh, but and I haven't thought of it before you said it now. <laughs> yeah, it's a week. It's, uh, it's mm-hmm. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we've all seen the movie Seven, so we know. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, how has, uh, uh, has, has your main character of, of Jonah, uh, how... Uh, what what has her um, growth been like through this series? Well, um, Jonah Lina, um, he has uh, changed over the series because although he's a very skilled detective inspector, he's also human. And um, mm. every case costs him something. Scars, he gets, yeah. yeah, he gets his scars both. Both in his um, on his body and in his soul, and I think with Lazarus, he looks down into an abyss mm. that really a darkness, uh, yeah, that yeah. yeah creeps into him. Yes, this fight uh, change is changing him. He's, he's, he's a different person on the other side, uh, which but, is interesting now when we write the next uh, book. Yeah, uh, but he, he's changing all through the story. And as we said, we are following him as a friend and we like getting to know him more and more, but we're still very curious about him because he keeps his secrets even to us. So he surprises us <laughs> a lot. <laughs> How would you describe his relationship with, with Saga? Well, uh, they are kind of like siblings. They respect each other and they are totally different. So they annoy each other also a bit. And with Lazarus, they they both have exactly the same information 
about the um, yeah the situation. Yeah, yeah, but Jonah draws his conclu- conclusions, and Saga draws totally different. And and I think this difference between them is manifested in these decisions they make. Totally different. And we meet a lot of readers want them to be together, you know, <laughs> as a pair, but, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. No, well, never say never, <laughs> no. but we can't see it right now. If, it, if it's time, it's time. Yes. <laughs> Th- that's really interesting that you say that, um, you know, it's never going to happen, but maybe, you know, we're, we're leaving that, that possibility <laughs> open. Um, do you, when you start thinking of a new novel, um, are, are these questions that you ask yourself, you know, like uh, about the, the character growth and, you know, where, where do I want to, you know, Jonah to go, uh, in this book or where do I want Saga to go? Or, you know, what, uh, are these things that you think about from the beginning or, uh, or does that just happen in the writing? Oh. Goes with the story. Yeah. yeah. So we always start with a, a case, of course, it's crime fiction. So the case must be interesting, but interesting also in a a personal way, must reflect the characters, must make them do things and push them in different direct directions. So 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 the uh, personal character development follows the story. Then we just, you know, try to follow. Yeah, because we have lived with Jonah Lynn and Saga Bauer now uh, for more than a decade. And as Alexander were talking about, uh, was talking about before, we come closer to them, but we still don't fully know them. <laughs> they are kind of mysteries to us. And this is, this is I think, what, what makes it so fascinating mm. to see them again in book after book and to yeah, push them harder and harder in a way. Or was there? The other characters, every character actually, uh, we plan a lot. Uh, we make our plot. We uh, it takes several months just yes, to do the plot. Every day working with the uh, cards, with a like we have one note or a card which describes one scene for one character, and then we write new ones and put mm-hmm. them in long lines and view the story so we understand each character's movement through the whole story but but when we start to write we we always notice and that's the kind of a magic thing when the characters do what they want to because they live their lives and they don't care about our notes they care about their lives yeah and their logic <laughs> yeah. way. and when you write you must you know go into the characters and then you have to you know Forget about notes, the lot we created, because you have to be true to each character. And that's uh, to to see where they want to go, not where we want them to go. Jackson's battle to take control over his own mind and life portrays what millions of people are fighting with around the world, mental illness. His mother, desperate to free him from his demons and desperation, faces her own turmoil and anguish, doing anything possible to save her son through love and hope. After countless emotional and heartbreaking triumphant moments, June and her son must both accept that only Jackson can save himself. Pick up Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin and discover why people are raving about this book and saying things like, Jackson is symbolic of millions living with some form of mental illness and his mother represents the millions who have their own struggles caring for someone with a mental health issue. Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin. Pick it up today at Amazon.com. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. 
Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels, along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden cost, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com Do you ever find yourself, uh, you know, it, in the beginning, like you described of your writing process, you meticulously plot out where the book is going. But do you ever find that in the writing of that scene that a, a character makes a turn or uh, a part of their uh, their personality exerts itself, which might change the direction of the rest of the book? Do you, do you ever find your plots changing in the writing? Absolutely. And that that is so surprising when it happens. But then we feel, yeah, we have this loyalty towards the character. We need to listen to them. Okay. Yeah, we can't we can't bend the story in a way that isn't yeah, isn't the story doesn't want to be no. bent in a way. For a start, you're trying to force them, of course, <laughs> because you have a really good story. But <laughs> but if they don't agree, then we know that we have to return. Uh, Go to, back to, to, to the yeah. notes, to the cards, and just you know, think it over again. Do you, um, because you do live with the story, uh, as it were, and you, and you talked uh, earlier about you know the discussion around the dinner table and how that you know spills into uh, you know other aspects of life that that, that the book kind of consumes uh, because you're a married couple and you live together and these stories live with you. Do you? Do you ever find it difficult to uh, to kind of draw a line and say, um, you know, we're we're not going to write this weekend, or you know, we're going <laughs> to completely take some uh, a headspace vacation, if you will? Uh, do Do you find it difficult to to draw a line oh, between awesome. your professional yeah. life? <laughs> Never happened. No, but you know, we we become happy when we write. We it's, love it. Yeah, we really love to do what we do. So, so it's actually not a problem for us, <laughs> this <laughs> limitless uh, writing that we do. But of course, we talk about other things too. It's, it's not <laughs> only uh, the writing, but, but when it's really intense, it's, it's all about writing. And I think writing must cost something, not just for the characters, but even also for the writer, for the writers in our case. And, and, uh, at least Alexandra, she always get nightmares in the middle of the process, and she dreams about the story. And when when it, that happened the first time, when we when we wrote the hypnotist, we became uh, you know scared. Maybe this is not healthy. But <laughs> but since the nightmares disappeared when the case was closed, when the story ended, we, we nowadays think it it's a good sign because. Mm. We're in total contact with the story when Alexandra had her nightmares. <laughs> but yeah. A, so when, I think we need to had so much nightmares when we wrote Yeah, Lazarus. with Lazarus. Oh, yes. Jurik Walter is really... He's... Uh, yeah. You dreamt about Saga. Yeah, and I was dreaming so much about Saga. I was, I was with her, <laughs> in a way, <laughs> trying to protect her. One thing that I love about your books is that there's always um, some subtext there to to be thinking about. Um, in the Rabbit Hunter, you you challenged us to uh, face childhood fears and uh, y- you know uh, things that that go bump in the night, and and, uh, and that was an interesting exploration of that. In Lazarus, there's a there's a great storyline uh, going on that. Um, uh, that that we find in the beginning of the book, there 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 are murders taking place, uh, but not just murders; these are criminals that are being killed, and it really makes us 
uh, look at our ideas of justice and um, and and um, the 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 criminal justice system in in you know particular, but our own thoughts about well, if if someone's being killed, but they're a a bad person to begin with, is that a a bad thing? And and how do what are my own personal feelings about? you know, um, uh, how we deal with, with punishment and, and things like that. It's a, it's a really interesting exploration that, that you guys come up with in this book. Where did the idea of, to have this killer taking out other criminals, where did that come from? Oh, well, no, <laughs> good question. Yeah. Well, it's kind of your Walter needed. And, uh, we are not spoiling anything, of course, but it was also important for us it is important for us that all characters are kind of complex. So even if they are murderers, something has happened in their lives that made them active. And so we, did, we never wanted to, to describe a, a criminal as a monster, but more to it. And uh, it, we have always uh, kind of written from the victim's perspectives. Yeah, and um, it was interesting to now write from the murderer's perspective when they turned into play. Yeah, and I think, you know, for us, crime fiction is, of course, entertaining. It's an entertainment. But it, um, these kind of books are also suited for, for important discussions. You know, you, you're not going to solve any big, uh, you know, questions or moral dilemmas, but we can start conversation mm-hmm. with the readers, as you said about, uh, you know, in the Lazarus, it's the worst of the worst mm-hmm. they find killed. It's like, it's a relief for everyone, but is it really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you want something like that to happen in your society? It's, 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 it's a question to the readers and to ourselves, of course. That's right. When you first start thinking about a new book and, um, you know, when when you first start working on Lazarus, um, of course, you have these characters, uh, you know, Jonah, Lena and, uh, and, and and Saga that 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 are part of the story and they each come with their own baggage and their own personal character growth. So you have that backstory of them. That are coming, but what? How do you start thinking about the plot for a new book? Or or, are there things that maybe you've read, or or news stories you've seen, Uh, or is it you know conversations about you know what would life be like if this happened? How does that plot start developing? Well, it's I think it's different from book to book, but with Lazarus, it it was totally clear to us from from the beginning what the book would be about. It was uh, the final battle yeah. between Jonah and Antagonist. I remember when we started to write The Hypnotist, we also started to collect, you know, uh, things from newspapers, pieces mm-hmm. of paper with new ideas, something we read in another book. We put it in a big cardboard box. Um, all these notes, yeah. all these possible ideas. But yeah. after, like, the third book, we noticed that we never ever opened that book. We just put that cardboard uh, book. That, bo- no. that that box. We just put, put the papers in there, <laughs> uh, and the notes, and the... so so we stopped with that because we didn't need that. Uh, it's, it's for us when a new idea comes, it uh, comes from cleaning and dishes, <laughs> and uh, uh, when we think it's good enough, um, if we think it's a good enough idea. Uh, an idea which we which makes our heart beat faster when we start to talk about it you know, and we start to see if it, is this, this is a good idea but is it big enough for a story mm. will, is it big enough for a book will, will, will it involve uh, you know Jonah is it passion involved yeah. is, it, is it possible to make this does it scare us yeah. is it, uh, is it crucial for us to write i don't think i think that is that are the because it must be because, yeah because you're going to spend like 
eight or ten hours every day, even the weekends, for more than a year, it must be something, a real hook for you. A word that we want to be in. Wait. So it's hard to say where the idea comes from, but, but it's not something read in newspaper. We never ever use real cases, or even though we do a lot of research, of course, but we never use the cases we read about. Alexandra, uh, you you have uh, mentioned a couple of times about being physically scared uh, in the in the the writing of a book, or you know, in the in the brainstorming, and and even talked about having nightmares uh, as the book process goes on. Um, you know, I, I think last time we talked about um, the idea that uh, uh, you know why people read. Um, books that that scare them and and why do we love situations um, that we would never want to see ourselves in and and I, I think the the thing we came up with in, in the conversation was that well these things help us to to uh, to maybe face demons or, or face um, you know, things that we would never want to go through from the safety of our reading chair um, as someone who who comes up with um, what is it like for you to be wrestling with a story that legitimately scares you? And how does that translate to the page? Oh, well, I think, I think it's kind of also a very satisfying journey from this horror, this chaos, this injustice to, to order in a way, because the satisfaction is you have Jonah Lena, you have Saga Bauer. Things work. <laughs> uh, they don't give up. They will hunt the perpetrator. And uh, I, I think that is a very enjoyable thing uh, because they are not like me. They are much braver and they will never give up. Uh, and, and it's also very enjoyable to write about characters that are so, you know, stubborn and brave and of course they make mistakes and they are human but they are totally different yeah i think it's a way to take care of your fears in some way it's not therapy or or not even catharsis but but it's a way to to handle your fears because you have control over the story at least some control and we trust you and we trust saga uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it's the same for for a reader too. So it's like reading and writing is very uh, similar. Yeah, yeah, very similar. Yeah. Do um do you guys think of of Lars as another entity? Um, do, will Lars write things that Alexandra or Alexander never would? Does it is it helpful to have this this third entity? That that you can inhabit, and and let him do the things that that maybe you wouldn't. Oh, it's oh, very helpful. Yeah. I think he is he is absolutely the key for our cooperation because we have totally different writing voices. We were writers each by each before, but uh, writing together, we really need Lars Kepler because we need to. I don't know. Um, Get into his voice, mm. his tone, yeah. his stories. Yeah. And it's completely different from uh, what I would write if I didn't have yes. this cooperation with Alexander. No, I could never write these stories by myself. It's impossible. Because it's, it's a work of us, our voices, and it's more than just two voices. It's not yeah. yeah, it's not <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we love books that have strong characters and um, and, and that we get to go on a journey with. And, uh, and 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 Jonah and Saga are definitely those. But there, there's another thing, um, you know, when you have a book with with such strong setting where the setting almost becomes a character in the book. Um, what is it about Scandinavia that uh, that is such a strong setting for these stories and almost becomes a character of its own. Oh, hard to tell because we live here. Yeah. <laughs> for us, it's the natural setting. <laughs> but, uh, 
Well, it, it's uh, this big difference between uh, maybe the summer and the winter. Now it's you know totally dark here in Stockholm, and the sun sets uh, around three o'clock. Mm. And uh, in the summertime, it's uh, the sun doesn't set at all. No, it's, it's maybe the big. Yeah, and the between. big darkness, and the, there aren't many people here. <laughs> well. No, it's you know Sweden is just ten million. Yeah, and in it's and it's a very big country, but full of just trees. Yeah, <laughs> mostly <of> trees. <laughs> no, I don't know if it. I think maybe the setting. I think we have this very strong tradition in Sweden of crime fiction, and it's kind of a democratic movement in a way. People right. have always read these stories and written these stories. Uh, I think also uh, Sweden is, is a quite modern society and, and still a bit uh, different. So I can, I can understand um, the curiosity on the, of the society here. Yeah. But as we said, Al for us it's natural. So. <laughs> well, Alexander, you mentioned um, the, the difference in, the, in daylight and dark. Um, that's that's an interesting, uh, you know, it, as someone who lives in the in the United States, where we have, um, you know, night and day every day. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's it's not something that that I really think about. But for you, light and darkness are are stark contrast, and sometimes you have all of one and none of the other. Or um, th that has to have some sort of subliminal psychological effect, I would think. At Absolutely. least it's not practical in a way. <laughs> no. <laughs> so silly. No, and uh, right now we are in the, you know, really mid-winter time. It's dark. Today it didn't well, get dark. No, uh, it didn't. Night. It didn't. Right. No, it was just dark all the time because there were really dark clouds on right. the few hours where the sun was up. So it's. It's it absolutely does something to you. Yeah, it's like the underworld or something. Sometimes it feels like you, this is not healthy. No. <laughs> well, we mentioned um in when we first started talking about about 2020, and this has been a strange year for everyone. Uh, and a, a lot of people are locked in at home and not able to get out much with with the pandemic going on. Um, how has this year affected you? you guys and in your creative process or has it affected you at all well we've been lucky of course as a writer uh, you can continue to work uh, right a difference uh, all the tours was cancelled of course yeah but, we were but coming but to the u.s so we've been so lucky yeah so far we have been very lucky because we still have our job this pandemic has cost Costs many people so much, and uh, our hearts bleed for all those who have suffered. Yeah. But we can't meet our mothers. We both have old and fragile mothers. I wish I could hug my mother. We won't see them for Christmas because we don't dare to. No, we can't so, do that. Uh, of course, it, it, it's it's a lot too. But uh, but basically, we've been lucky. But it is a very strange year, and it's not over yet. <laughs> right. Well, and, and the horrible thing is, you think it, think about this as twenty twenty, but you know it's going to continue, be it more. Well, we can we can definitely hope for a better year next year, and and hopefully yes, we start. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um. So Lazarus is out everywhere now. Um. And if we know how the publishing industry works, um, this book has been off of your desks for quite a while. And uh, so what are you guys working on now? Oh, we are working on uh, the ninth book. Yeah, yeah because uh, we finished uh, the eighth book and yeah. it has been out. It's a strange year now, a couple of months. It's in uh, some parts of Europe and Sweden, and it's called The Mirror Man. And uh, now we are actually writing the next book. So, uh, yeah, we think we have a really good story. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm excited to see what you guys come up with. Um, Lazarus is out available everywhere now. We're going to put links to it in the show notes. Um, Where can people find you if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do? Oh, we are on Instagram and on Facebook, or they can just call us on Skype. (laughs) (laughs) No, but we really love to uh, talk to our readers. Yeah, and that is something we... Really miss yeah, we are yeah. so so sorry that we haven't been able to meet our readers because it's it's the best thing we know except for writing. We we feel we have the best readers in the world. <laughs> well, I I'll, I'll have to say that um th- there's no substitution for getting to meet you guys in person. Um but your website is a fantastic resource for people that are fans of the books and really want to dig into um, you know, details about characters and uh, you guys have done a phenomenal job of, of really giving us uh, a, a deep dive into what all you do. Thank you. Yeah, we forgot to say that. Thank you for mentioning it. Yeah. We also we think it's a great website, actually. And we didn't do it, but, but we are very wrote, grateful. Wrote yeah. Text, of course. Yeah. Well, we'll put links to all those places in the show notes to make it easy for people to connect with you. Uh, Alexander and Alexandra, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Let's meet each other next. (laughs) Let's do it. I'm all for it. A hitman with a conscience. Ian Bragg is paid to kill people. Only bad people and not many, but for a great deal of money. Case the target. Make the hit. Move on until he meets the woman with sparkling green eyes who changes everything. A few pre-readers had this to say about Ian Bragg. Mark Dawson, million-selling thriller author, says a rip-roaring ride from start to breathless finish. Craig Martell hit a home run with the operator. The taut, lean prose and lightning-fast pace make this a page-turner without sacrificing an ounce of story or depth. You'll find yourself rooting for the hitman main character as he faces the toughest decision of his career. The Operator is the start of a new thriller series I expect to see burning up bestseller list for years to come, says A.C. Fuller, author of the Crime Beat and Alex Vane media thrillers. Suave, romantic, and lethal, Ian Bragg is everything you want in a highly paid assassin. Can't wait to ride this train, says James Blatch, self-publishing formula. It's been a long time since I fell this hard in love with a book, a very long time. Author of Women of Wine County Romantic Suspense, Terry Wells Brown says, Grab this book from Craig Martell, The Operator. Bone Thief, John Driscoll, Book One by Thomas O'Callaghan. A sociopathic killer is using the internet to lure seemingly random women to their gruesome deaths in New York City. During his heinous murder spree, this madman is extracting the bones of his victims. His sheer brutality has the residents of the Big Apple in panic mode. Who is this twisted psycho who's abducted a housewife in broad daylight only to dispose of her lifeless body alongside a lake in Prospect Park, nailed the boneless remains of a nameless drifter to the underside of a boardwalk at Rockaway Beach? allowed the gutted corpse of a single parent to wash ashore under the Brooklyn Bridge and has had the audacity to leave the desecrated body of the Magnolia Tea heiress rotting atop trash at one of the city's sanitation dumps. NYPD's top cop, Homicide Commander John W. Driscoll, has never witnessed such savagery. Hammered daily by the district attorney, the mayor, and the police commissioner, the lieutenant who's battling his own inner demons, must use every resource available to put an end to the killings. In a race against time, Driscoll, aided by Sergeant Alagante and Detective Cedric Tomlinson, sets out on a roller coaster of an investigation to first identify the villainous fiend and then put an end to his butchering. Grab Bone Thief by Thomas O'Callaghan now.